بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Our subject today موضوعنا اليوم is الشفاعة intercession The word الشفاعة You hear the word a lot intercession It means to intervene for somebody Shafa'a means to intervene for somebody, to, uh, to assist somebody in a matter, to intervene with them, uh, for them, uh, to a higher authority. So the word shafa'a, shafa'a comes from the word shafa'a. A shafa is the opposite of witr, isn't it? A shafa'a is the opposite of witr. Witr means odd, a shafa'a means even. So when shafa'a occurs linguistically, when there's intercession, someone comes along, you were alone before, you were witted before, and that shefer, that person, the other person comes, he is a shefer with you. He, is, he makes you even and, uh, and assists you. You can sort of depend on the fact that that person can help you in some matter. These are just linguistic meanings. So you've all, you all hear the word shefer a lot, don't you? Shefer. Was shefer i wal watr. So just to put that into, condition, into context. Shefer. Shefer comes from the word which means even. And it's to do with intervening for somebody. When we, uh, you, this, uh, the, the respected brothers, the respected people of this masjid uh, who have arranged these uh, series of talks about the Day of Judgment, um, because it's about, these talks are about the Day of Judgment, then when we talk about Shafa'a, there's one hadith that really comes to uh, everybody's mind. Um, that hadith is the hadith which is in Al-Bukhari and Muslim and other books. In fact, there are so many hadith on this topic between authentic, authentic to weak. And uh, Sheikh Muqbil uh, ibn Hadi al-Wadi'i, he's written a, a volume on this, a very thick volume of all the narrations, uh, a good 200 pages or so of strong narration, weak, authentic narrations, strong narrations, weak narrations, and he, t he talks about these different narrations. Very interesting book to read and delve into if you want to go further in this topic uh, with, with regards to the, the narrations. Um, once again, the hadith we hear most of the time is the hadith of al shafa al-kubra. There are different types of shafa ah which I'll mention, but no, ma no matter which way I look at this topic, I have to start with this hadith. Um, which is the hadith that on the day of judgment, when the mawqif, when the people standing becomes difficult to bear, uh, they will go to Adam alayhi salam. And they will ask Adam alayhi salam to intercede for them. And, which, and Adam alayhi salam will say, Nafsi, uh, nafsi, nafsi, idhabu ila ghayri. Myself, myself, myself. Go to somebody else. Go to somebody else. Indeed, I ate from the tree. Indeed, I ate from the tree. My Lord today is angry. My Rabb is angry today in a, way, in, a, in a way he has never been angry before. So the main contents of what Adam says, he remembers his error. He remembers, he recalls the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He contemplates on himself, saving himself, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. And then he goes, says, go to somebody else. So he excludes himself from the ability to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to, for the day of judgment to be commence and begin. So when we talk about shafa'a al-kubra, we're talking about the first shafa'a we're talking about, which is khas and specific to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the shafa'a, the intercession, where, Allah, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa intervenes with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asks Allah, eventually after sujood, etc., to allow the judgment to begin. So we're talking about the perils, the dangers, the hardships of the Day of Judgment, which you've been talking about in previous weeks, and you've been reflecting on. But for the Day of Judgment to begin, people go to Adam alayhi salam, and he will decline concerned about himself. Then he, he will say, go to Nuh, because إِنَّهُ أَوَّلُ أَوَّلُ الرُّسُلُ He is the first messenger. Nuh alayhi salam, 
there are two views. Was he sent to the whole world or was he sent to a particular nation, a large nation? One view says that the flood of Nuh for example, uh, covered the whole world. Another view says that the flood of Nuh or Noah السلام, covered a part of the world. Um, nevertheless, Nuh السلام, is described in this hadith as awwal al-rusul, the first messenger. Him being the first messenger doesn't negate Adam السلام's status. Adam السلام's status was he's the first Nabi. Rasulullah was asked, is Adam, uh, was Adam السلام, a prophet? And he said, yes, Nabi Mukallam, a prophet who was spoken to. The word used here is Nabi. As for this hadith in Bukhari and other books about Nuh, says that he is the first Rusul, the first messenger. Many of you have come across the narration of Ata, who mentioned from Ibn Abbas that, Abdul, that in the time of Nuh, السلام, there, were four, there were five people, Wad, Su'a', Yaguth, Ya'uq, and Nasr. These five people were extremely righteous. They, uh, and the implication here is that between the time of Adam السلام, until the time of Nuh السلام, there was no major shirk, there was no idol worship. Everyone used to worship Allah. There may have been major sins, minor sins, as we know from the story of, of Habil and Qabil, Cain and Abel, that was murder. But it didn't make, mean they were mushriks who, have left, who had left the fold of Islam. So Nuh السلام, in Nuh السلام's time, whether it's just before his time or while he was still alive, because we, knew, we know he gave da'wah for how many years? For 950 years. We, we can't be sure exactly when these people were around. Um, but it, it, it's described that they were in the time of Nuh, whether they were born before him or after him, Allah alam. The point is that, the, um, the point, and with reflection you can deduct it, deduce it. The point is that Nuh alayhi salam, as the narration of Nuh about Nuh salam, says that Wad Su'a' Yaghuth Nuh and Nasr were righteous people. And when they died, people missed them. I'm paraphrasing the narration. And then Shaytan whispered to them. And the nature of Waswasa, the nature of Waswasa is that people, you think it's your own reflection, your own, that they are your own thoughts. But Shaytan, so Shaytan whispered to them, saying, were you not more righteous when they were around and you could see them? And when you, when you saw them, they would remind you of Allah. Remember in the time of the even the, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the Tabi'een, they would say, that we, would, we would look at Sufyan al thawri and we would be remind, reminded of Allah. When Ibn al-Qayyim was in prison, they said that we would come out of prison. We, 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 so when we, were, when we were overwhelmed in prison, and the, dun, the dunya, the world became so constrained to us, we would but look at the face of Ibn Taymiyyah, and we would feel rejoice and happiness once again. Him and others as well mentioned this. Uh, so the shaitan came to them and said, would you, should you not therefore make some idols? If you make those idols, you can remember them. So the narrations mention that they made those idols and initially they did remember Allah by reminding themselves of Allah through those idols and they weren't worshipped. Then later on it was forgotten why they, why they were around and then they, uh, why those idols were there and then they were worshipped. And the nature of worship is that people worship with good, so-called good intentions to go through them to Allah. They think that is shafa'a, intercession. So, uh, the, um, so, that, so then Nuh was sent as a messenger. So we see a Rasul is somebody who is sent for a major change in beliefs, when major change in beliefs occur. So he comes with a new revelation, uh, with a new law. Uh, the ulama debate the issue, what, what's the exact difference? And there, there are lots of views. And in the end, you can see there, there must be a difference because Nuh is described as the first Rasul and Adam is described as the first Prophet. Well, he's the first Bashar, Abu Bashar. Okay, so he, he, Nuh comes with a new law. And then he was given a sign that when, after his people rejected him for years and years, um, there came a time that he made dua against them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he's to build the boat, the ark, and that they, they're going to be punished. Because after 950 years, it's a long time to wait, isn't it? For people to, for hardly anybody to, to respond. And they kept on, they continued to insult him, even though they knew stories of their ancestors, etc. Um, and then he was told that when you see water appearing through your oven, through where they made bread, then that's the sign that you're to ride the ark. You get on the ark, eh, that's it. So he went on the ark. And when he went on the ark, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, did you not say 
that you would answer my dua. And uh, he said, so he asked Allah to save his son. And he said, Innahum, did you not say that you will save my family? So Allah said, so the Nuh said, Innahum min ahli, his son who was drowning, he said, Innahum min ahli, he's my son, he's, he's of my family. And Allah replied that Innahu laysa min ahlik, he's not from your family. Uh, by breaking himself off from Tawheed continuously, uh, Allah described him as that. And that doesn't, uh, we can't ref use this sufficiently to reflect on the hukum of people who've got non Muslim families today. We ask that needs more adillah. The point was that because he made that dua and Allah had to correct him, when he is approached on the day of judgment, he will say, people will come to him. And we don't know between one prophet to another prophet, messenger, how long it will take for them to make that journey. So they will go to Nuh in whatever conditions they are in. Uh, of the, the sweat and the perspiration and the hardship. And they will say, Ya Nuh, unzur ila man hanufi. Look at our condition, look at our situa situation. Call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us out of our conditions. And he will say, Nafsi, 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 myself, myself, myself. Indeed, I made a dua which I shouldn't have. Indeed, my Lord is angry today in a way he has never been angry before. Go to somebody, somebody else. Go to Ibrahim alayhi salam because he is the uh, because he is the Khalil of Allah. In another narration, we do know that Rasulullah sallam is also a Khalil of Allah subhanahu wa taala, but he was the first Khalil. Rasulullah sallam was the second Khalil, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam used to begin the hadith of Shifa frequently, saying that I am the master, the leader of the sons of Adam, and I'm not boasting. أنا سيد ولد آدم ولا فخر. حمك الله. أنا سيد ولد آدم يوم القيامة ولا فخر. I'm not boasting. So they will go to Ibrahim عليه السلام. And Ibrahim عليه السلام will say, he will be approached. And we know how Allah سبحانه loves Ibrahim عليه السلام. And Ibrahim عليه السلام will say, نفسي 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 myself myself myself. Meaning. I'm too concerned with myself, myself, myself. And one of the essential characteristics of a prophet, of a messenger, is that they, they are over-concerned with people. They can't help but be over-concerned with people. To the extent that Rasulullah was described as that anybody could take him by the hand to have their needs fulfilled uh, with whatever help they wanted. He was too shy to say no, and he wanted to help people. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wallahu fi awni al-abd. In Sahih Muslim, Allah continues to help a person, a slave, as long as, as long as that person is helping somebody else, his brother. So that's encouraged in Islam. But look how the prophets will be so overwhelmed with what they see on the Day of Judgment. They will say, Nafsi, 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 myself, 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 Ithabu ila ghayri, go to somebody else. Go to, uh, because I lied thrice, I lied three times. And indeed, my Lord is angry today in a way he has never been angry before. Go to somebody else. Idhabu ila ghayri, idhabu ila Musa kalimullah. I'll come up for riwayah. He said, I told three lies. What were these three lies? Of those three lies was lies in quotes. Meaning the way we say in quotes these days are underlined. He was, Ibrahim al is being ex extremely conscious that he said something which is opposite to the truth, even though that type of lie, which is, is called a tawriya, which is a type of um, intelligent deception for a greater good, where it's not an absolute lie in itself. For, for, for example, look at the example. When people, when his people, he had given da'wah to his people when he was young and to his father, he gave them so much da'wah and they, they ridiculed him and, and they made fun of him. Um, he wanted to make an example. So he, he wanted them to use their intellect regarding the idols. Um, so when they went to their Eid, the, the word uses Eid, a festival, a celebration, he said, Inni, when he was invited, he said, Inni saqeem. Indeed I am. I'm sick, I'm unwell. What's he sick regarding? He's sick regarding the shirk and the kufr and the distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he let them think that he was physically or medically unwell. So for him, that's a lie. For him, he considered that a lie. Look how our examples are so, were so meticulous. 
were so conscious about their words. Yet people tell you, tell big lies today, and they say, I haven't lied. Ibrahim didn't even lie. It wasn't even a lie. It was what we call tawriya. And he's being, linguistically he can fall under lying, um, but intelligent deception for a greater good. The, but he was conscious about it. Because um, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, As-sidqu tamatnina, honesty gives you peace. wal kadibu riba. And when you tell a lie, it makes your heart unsettled. When you tell a lie, it makes your heart unsettled. So with this consciousness Ibrahim alayhi had, even that made him unsettled. And he was, he, he was fearful. Of the, the three things was that he told his wife Sarah, he told his wife Sarah that we're going to this king, we're in the kingdom of this mighty king, mighty, that words for myself actually, the, the, he, he was a mighty king um, uh, of Egypt, could have been an ancient pharaoh, Allahu alam, uh, because this Egyptian, ancient Egyptian word for kings is Fir'aun and Pharaoh. Um, do not, if, if he asks you who I am, let's say I'm your brother. So, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً We're all brothers. We're all sons of Adam, alayhi salam. We're all brothers. We're all sisters. Um, so, the, the reason he, he wanted her to utter that tawriya was he was a mighty king, a tyrant actually, and it wasn't unlikely that if he knew that she had a husband, that he would just kill the husband in order to be able to marry her so people didn't think wrong of him. Um, so it was okay to create a reason to kill Ibrahim alayhi um, but he wanted to protect his honor with regarding that uh, Sarah alayhi salam. So every time he, so she, she, they, were, they were taken in, and she said, he's my brother. He wasn't killed. And then she, every time he, the tyrant, approached her, she, uh, she would make a dua. Uh, Allah makfini bima shit. Allah makfini bihim bima shit. Oh Allah, suffice me against them with whatever you wish. And then he would become paralyzed. He became paralyzed head to toe. <laughs> and uh, almost totally paralyzed. And he told her t to stop that happening to him. And she made supplication, she made dua, and it stopped. And he said that he wouldn't try to approach her again. But the second, a second night, he tried to approach her again. And the same dua was made by her. And then he was paralyzed. And she, he insisted that he would not try to approach her again if she released him. She made supplication, she made dua. And, and he was released. The third night, the same thing happened, and he promised again. Um, and it, it teaches us that sometimes when we're living under tyranny, one of the best things to do is sabr and dua. Sabr uh, and dua. And even Ibrahim salam, didn't necessarily have one dua that would just have that person destroyed and killed. And look at the, the, the test Ibrahim is <coughs> being put through. His, it's his wife. <laughs> being approached by this person. But he left the matter to Allah, his honor, his dignity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the ibtila and the tests we get are not from the direction we'd like them to be. They are from the direction we least expect them to be and frequently from our weakness, our weak points. How does Maryam alayha salam feel being one of the best of women? One of the best of women and being so chaste and far from anything doubtful to be accused of zina. So we are tested, not from where we want to be tested, but frequently from our weak points. That's why when, you, ya ikhwa, when we go through tests and shada'id and hardships, nasta'inu billah, let's seek Allah's help. The one who gave the test takes us out of the test as well. And uh, as Allah Ta'ala says, in the Quran, وَمَنْ مَا أَصَابَ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ مَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Whatever musiba, tragedy, calamity touches you, it's by the permission of Allah. فَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَهِ But whoever believes in Allah, Allah guides his heart. The ulama of tafsir mentioned, it is to recognize that this, the musiba came from Allah Ta'ala. And to know that if he initiated that in his qadr, that he initiated its end to and the way out of it. So when you highlight that, highlight that matter to yourself and believe that truly, 
He will guide you. That's the most important quality to have during a musibah is to trust Allah, to be with Allah Ta'ala, to not think ill of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, but to think Ill of, Ill of ourselves. And to look at the favours, the ni'am which come down upon us continually, every second, millions of favours, every second are coming down upon us. And when He takes one away, we are afflicted, we are in trouble. We can't bear it, and we, and we forget sometimes. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala forgive us and help us be of the shakirin. And, uh, and accept your shukr and your ta'a and our ibadah, ya arhamar rahimin. So he was, so th we're talking about the, the kathib, this quote unquote kathib uh, of Ibrahim alayhi salam, how he will be overconscious. With these few things, look how the anbiya are so conscious. How will we be in the day of judgment when we know where, where we have been, done, said? experienced subhanallah just one day of the days of some of the muslimin in london allah mustaan what what are we going to how are we going to feel we've got so much to go through this this there's so much to go through yet those people will be going from one person to non prophet to another because you despite what we know about ourselves you have to go to the, the next prophet and he would say, Nafsi, 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 idhabu ila ghayri, go to somebody, go to somebody else. <clears throat> and he will, they will go to Musa as we mentioned before. Musa will say the same thing. He will say, he will say, when he's asked, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us out of the condition we're in. Um, it means what? It's not, we're not talking about entering Jannah. Just for the commencement of judgment, that's what is being requested. So after how many weeks, days, months, years, Allahu A'lam. This is the reality, ya ikhwah. There are ayat of hope, etc. as well. But this is the reality of the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. People will go to him and he will say that indeed, inni qataltu nafsan bi ghayri haqq. Indeed, I killed someone without right. Musa alayhi salam. He was, when he was a young man, he had been raised in the, in the palace of Fir'aun. Um, even though he was from an Israeli origin, from the Bani Israel, he lived with the Aqbat, the Qubt, the Coptics. So, or the, or the Copts, the... So one day he was in the town and the Quran describes this, that when people were absent-minded, which re refers to perhaps people were sleeping in the daytime, taking a little nap, he saw two men fighting. One was from his people, from the children of Israel, and the other from his enemy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to Fir'aun's people, Fir'aun and his people, as Adu from the moment he was picked up by the, uh, picked up when he was floating down the river in a box. Uh, when he was picked up, uh, he's described as Adu, even, uh, that they are the Adu, or he will be even Adu for them, which an Adu means an enemy, someone who is going to be your opponent. فَاسْتَغَاثَهُ الَّذِي مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ عَلَىٰ عَدُوِهِ the one who was from his people asked for some help, help me. It looked like he's being oppressed. So from Musa Islam's experience of the, his Fir'aun's people is that they normally oppress, uh, oppress the Bani Israel because they were slaves. They were enslaved to do the tasks and the, and the heavy labor of the people of Fir'aun, of, of, of Misr and Egypt at that time. So following his assumption, and following what it looked like this was the norm in the situation, he got himself involved. فَوَكَزَهُ uh, مُوسَى Musa alayhi struck him فَقَضَ عَلَيْهِ And he died. So Musa alayhi salam was in a state of shock. He didn't intend to hit, to hurt him that much. He intended to end the fight. That if one's being hit, the best way for him to strike, to, to stop this scenario for him was to do the to counter the, the other person's punches who's not stopping uh, his oppression. <laughs> what did he say? Musa said, هذا من عمل الشيطان. 
He said this is from the actions of shaitan. So if he does something wrong, and he doesn't say immediately, oh, I had a right to do it, it's, it's not my fault, it's his fault. Well, he started it, I didn't, I didn't mean to do it. See, look at the nafs sometimes, we, we as human beings, sometimes, some of us, we create excuses. But he didn't, he said, هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ It was a mistake, but it's a huge mistake. هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ عَدُوٌ مُضِلُّ مُبِينٌ He said, indeed, he is an enemy, the shaytan is an enemy. Mudil, and he deviates people, Mubin, clearly. قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي فَقَالَ إِنَّ رَبِّ إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي فَقَالَ إِنَّ رَبِّ فَغَفَرَ الله. He said, oh my Lord, indeed I've done wrong to myself. And Allah forgave him. The fact that Allah forgave him is in the unseen. We don't know there was any revelation telling him he's been forgiven for that particular incident to him immediately. Um, and that could be the case that many of us, we say, Rabbi oh Allah forgive me. And, we, and it's forgiven immediately. But look at his method, Musa, Musa alayhi method in asking forgiveness. One, admitting the sin. Two, calling out with Allah's names, Rabb, my Lord, feeling that connection. Three, blaming himself again. Inni dhalamtu nafsi, I've done wrong to myself. So forgive me. And Allah forgave him. A huge crime in the sight of the laws of their, of their day. But as a mistake from a Nabi, um, Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. But still, his consciousness of that is not, he wasn't told that he's, he's forgiven. So on the day of judgment, he's in a state of terror about this incident, about what's happened to him. Or it could be that he's, he's been told afterwards, but still because of the extreme caution, they didn't allow, didn't want to, they, they were, they were, they were, because of the extreme caution, they were extremely conscious. Um, by the way, just on a, on a side issue, which is actually an important issue, we see a similar methodology manifest itself in the methodology of uh, Adam, our father Adam alayhi salam. When Allah Ta'ala reproached and corrected Iblis la'anahullah for not doing sujood, Allah says to him, ma mana'aka Allah tasjuda id amartuk. What stopped you Iblis from doing, from prostrating when I commanded you? He said, you created me from fire, and you created him from earth, from teen. So, look at the methodology of Iblis la'anahullah, when he is reprimanded for a sin. His method is to justify the sin. Tabrir. To justify the sin. His methodology was also to make an analogy. Look, look into his uh, corrupted intellect to try to justify his sin. So we call this al-qiyas al-fasid. Qiyas that's gone wrong basically, corrupt qiyas. And using analogy and intellect and logic in a corrupt way. If you use intellect in a good way, it leads you back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he tried to get people to reflect by telling them when the, when the, when the, sun, when the stars rose, when the moon rose, uh, and when the sun rose, that that is my Lord. Each time he'd say, that is my Lord. And when it's set, he'd say, no, that can't be my Lord. My Lord cannot set. To try to make them think and reflect. <clears throat> so Adam alayhi salam, alayhi salam, when he ate from the tree, Allah Ta'ala asked him, uh, he said, Rabbana dhalamna anfusana. He said, my Lord, our Lord, we have done wrong to ourselves. Did he justify it? No. Did he look for an excuse? No. He, did he even mention shaitan in that situation? Did he say it was shaitan who did waswasa to me? It was his fault. Blame him, Ya Rabb. He just looked at what he did. Putting aside his own, uh, the, the influence. And that's, we should expect more of ourselves. Instead of blaming uh, others, shaitan, and sometimes sihr and etc. Blame, we should take more responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us in this land to allow us to love his deen and learn about his deen. He wants good for us. He's blessed us. He's made us most fortunate. We're, we are extremely fortunate. So manhaj of Musa alayhi salam in his sin, what was it? In his sin, his dhanb, his error, uh, was is that um, one, it, you can disassociate from the sin. By, uh, one, one of the things that helps you from disassociating from the sin is by saying this is from shaitan. Give him the full blame first. That's one approach. And then secondly, blame yourself because 
of your, you, sh you should have expected more from yourself. And thirdly, seek forgiveness. And with this, there's, there's, there's so much understanding and, and khushu' in that tawbah. And as Allah yataqabbal. Then, people will go to Isa alayhi. He will say, idhabu ila ghayri, idhabu ila Isa ibn Maryam. Go to Isa ibn Maryam. And he will say the same. Nafsi, nafsi, idhabu ila ghayri. And the riwayat of al-Bukhari mentioned, وَلَمْ يَذْكُرْ ذَنْبًا He didn't mention any sin. He didn't mention any sin. And then, he would tell people, اِذْهَبُوا إِلَى Muhammad. Go to Muhammad. غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ Allah has forgiven him his previous, his past previous, his future sins. <clears throat> and they will go to him. So Isa alayhi salam would say, إِنَّ رَبِّ قَدْ غَضِبَ الْيَوْمْ غَضَبًا لَمْ يَغْضَبْ قَبْلَهُ مِثْلَهُ Indeed, my Lord has become so angry today in a way he's never been angry before, previously. وَلَنْ يَغْضَبْ مِثْلَهُ بَعْبَعْدُ مِثْلَهُ And after this, he will never be angry again like this. وَلَمْ يَذْكُرْ ذَنْبًا And a mistake, a sin was not mentioned. نَفْسِي 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 Myself, myself, myself. اِذْهَبُوا إِلَى غَيْرِ Go to someone, somebody else. اِذْهَبُوا إِلَى مُحَمَّدٍ فَيَأْتُونَ مُحَمَّدًا صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ I said they will go to Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Um, and in a narration, they will say, يَا Muhammad, O oh, the illustrious praised one. Muhammad, O oh, the praised one. أَنْتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ you are the messenger of Allah. You are the seal of the Prophet. قَدْ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ Allah has forgiven you your previous sins and what, and your and your the sins you did, the previous and future sins. إِشْفَعْ لَنَا إِلَى رَبِّكَ Intercede for us to your Lord. أَلَا تَرَى إِلَى مَا نَحْنُ فِيهِ Do you not see the condition we are in? فَانْطَلَقَ Then he would go forth. Uh, and then he says, I will go until I'm under the arsh, the throne. And I will fall in prostration to my Lord. And then Allah Ta'ala will open for me uh, praise and compliments for Allah which has not been opened up for anybody before me. Thumma, and that, that, subhanAllah, that is fatah. That is fatah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up for somebody a praise they have never said before. That is a ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are in sujood and dua and you are praising and glorifying and you haven't felt this before, then this is so great. We read of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah that when he was in prison, uh, he spoke in his letters about how, how uh, because he was asked, something I like to quote, that once when he was being taken to prison, one of the farmers said to him, um, Yes, yes, Sayyidi, هذا, إن هذا منزلة, منزلة الصبر. Uh, oh, my master. And they used to respect their sheikhs with words like master, etc. This is, indeed, this is the time for you to practice the station of the, the spiritual station of patience. And he said, Indeed, the opposite. It is now time for me to be more grateful. Because he used to write in his letters and others that when he was in prison and worshipping and devoting his time to Allah, reading Quran, that Allah Ta'ala would open up doors of understanding who he is, his names and attributes, which he previously hadn't reached. Because knowledge is two types. One, knowledge which you learn from Al-Quran and Sunnah. And two, there is experiencing the knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah. There's no other source. I'm not saying there's a third revelation. No. Astaghfirullah. Abadan. What we're saying is that if you learn the Al-Kitab al sunnah you learn, you've learnt Al-Ilm. But once you practice the Ilm of Sadaqah, or Sabr, or Shukr, or Sujood, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala gives you more understanding. So when Rasulullah Sallallahu said, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِي خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ If Allah wants to give someone understanding, He gives them fiqh of the deen. Understanding of the religion includes knowledge with action. 
Because that action, the experience of the knowledge, makes you understand that knowledge better. <coughs> طيب المحامد يا محمد ذن ثم يفتح الله علي من محامده وحسن ثنائه على شيئا لم يفتحه على أحد قبلي ثم يقادني بسجهم يا محمد ارفع رأسك raise your head سل تعطع سل تعطع ask and you'll be granted واشفع تشفع intercede intervene for people and that shall be granted to you the intercession will be accepted فأرفع رأسي and I shall raise my head فأقول أمتي يا رب and he will say oh, oh my lord my nation if we reflect on this he speaks about his ummah he could have said يا ربي أدخلني الجنة oh my lord take me to Jannah subhanallah if, if any human no, no, a normal human who is who's, who's in the terrible experience of the terrors of the Day of Judgment, you would naturally just say, Adkhilni al-Jannah, Ya Rab, just take me out of this, take me to al-Jannah. What does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa say? Ummati, Ya Rab, my Ummah. That's a lesson for us, Ya Ikhwa, Ya Ikhwa al-Kiram, honorable brothers and attendees and those who listen to this. That he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had love for us which we cannot imagine. He thought about the future people who would come. He thought, thought about the, the present people, the, the companions he was living with. And it was a love that was deep. A love uh, that was deep. So, of the ahadith of the people who deserve intercession, we are told that once you hear the adhan and you say, Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wati tamma Oh Lord, oh Allah, the one who is the Lord of this call that's so perfect, the adhan. Uh, Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wati tamma Then what? Wa salati al-qa'imah. And the Lord of the prayer to be established. A'ati Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Grant Muhammad al-wasila. Give him the wasila, the ability to intercede for us. Wasila, it wasil, uh, that he can uh, intercede, as we've mentioned. It's slightly different to the word shafa'a, but used interchangeably. Aati Muhammad al wasila wal fadila and virtue. Wa atihi maqam al mahmud al ladi wa'dah. And grant him the praiseworthy position which you have promised him. Inna la yukhlu fil mi'ad is da'if. In bayhaqi. Let's look at the hadith. Maqam al mahmudan is what we're talking about here. Do you know why it's called Maqam al-Mahmud, the praiseworthy position and station? Can you understand how happy people will be just to know that after he prostrates Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for so long, just to be taken out of just waiting, to be taken out of waiting, because of that, everybody will praise, will feel praise for him and will feel gratitude towards Rasulullah and understand his position in the sight of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why is it called Maqam al-Mahmud, the praiseworthy station? Because once he does what he does, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every human being will be filled with thanks and praise. Uh, the praise of thanks, not the praise of worship for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So had to naqbal al-hadith, naqbal al-hadith inshaAllah. He would say, Ya Ummati, Ya Rabb, Ummati, Ya Rabb, Ummati, Ya Rabb. My Lord, my people, my people, my people. For you call, Ya Muhammad, O oh Muhammad, Adkhil min ummatika. Then, and this is the second time. فَأَرْفَعُ رَأْسِي فَأَرْفَعُ رَأْسِي فَأَقُولُ Let me repeat this so it's clearer. After he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will be told, Ya Muhammad, irfa' رَأْسَكَ O oh Muhammad, raise your head. سَلْ تُعْطَعْ Ask, you'll be granted. وَشْفَعْ تُشَفَعْ Intercede, and that intercession will be accepted. فَأَرْفَعُ uh, رَأْسِي And I shall raise my head. فَأَقُولُ أُمَّتِي يَا رَبْ أُمَّتِي يَا رَبْ أُمَّتِي يَا رَبْ My people, my Lord, my people, my Lord, my people, my Lord. فقال, فَيُقَالْ يَا محمد. It will be said, O oh Muhammad, أَدْخِلْ مِنْ أُمَّتِكَ لا مَنْ لَا حِسَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ الْبَابَ الْأَيْمَنْ مِنْ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَّةِ Enter from your Ummah those who have no account لا حساب on the right door of the doors of Jannah. Min al bab al ayman, min abwab al Jannah. Wa hum shuraka nas fi masi wa dalik min abwab. Even though they can participate in the other doors, they have the right to participate in the other doors. 
as well. So, la hisaba alayhim. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in one hadith, hadith of Ukasha, uridat alayya al-umam. Indeed, the nations were paraded before me. This could be in a dream or in his mi'raj. Allahu alam. But he was, the, the nations, meaning on the Day of Judgment, were paraded before me. فَرَأَيْتُ النَّبِيًّا وَمَعَهُ رَحْتُ And I saw a prophet, and he had a group of people with him. Meaning, these are the people who actually followed him and didn't, and didn't reject him. A prophet coming with the people who followed him and believed in him. وَالنَّبِي مَعَهُ رَجُلْ And I will see another prophet, and he will have a man with him. أو رجلان, or two men, just two followers out of a whole town or city. وَالنَّبِي مَعَهُ وَلَيْسَ مَعَهُ لَيْسَ مَعَهُ أَحَدْ And there will be another prophet who will not have a single follower. He will not have a single person with him. فَإِذَا رُفِعَ فَإِذَا رُفِعَ لِي فَإِذَا سَوَادٌ عَظِيمٌ فَأَقُولُ فِي نَفْسِي فَقُلْتُ فِي نَفْسِي إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتِي And when I would, I'd be made to look up, I'd look up and I'd see a huge darkness, like a huge multitude of people. And I would think they are my ummah. And Jibreel says to me, إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُ إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُ مُوسَى وَإِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُ مُوسَى Indeed, these are the, this is the ummah of Musa alayhi salam. فَإِذْ رُفِعَ عَلِي فَإِذَا سَوَادٌ عَظِيمٌ But I'll be look, made to look once again. And there will be another huge multitude. And Jibreel would say, alayhi salam, هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكَ You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you know that he used to pray through the night weeping with his beard soaking and his tears making a puddle in the ground, on the ground because of his tears. And he would say ayat like, repeat one narration. He repeated this ayah through the night in, in his night prayer. In to adhibuhum fa innahu in to adhibuhum fa innahu ibaduk. If you punish them, then you've the right to because they're your worship, they're your cre creatures. Talking about the ummah. When taghfil lahum fa inna ka anta al-ghafur rahim But if you forgive them, then you are forgiving and merciful. He's basically asking oh Allah, guide them, guide them, guide them through the night. Beard soaking a puddle in front of him, one ayah repeating, which shows, of course, fiqh wise, you can repeat in tahajjud and sunan, etc. You can repeat ayat which affect you. There's no harm in that. Uh, narration is authenticated by Sheikh Muhammad Nasruddin al Albani and others. So, <coughs> where were we before the narration of switched off? Before the narration of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi weeping through the night, to be told, yes, he would look, he would be told, "This is your ummah," and with them, with this, seventy thousand people will enter Jannah bi ghairi hisabin wa la adhab, without hisab, without their sins being counted, open and closed, wa la adhab. There will be no discussion, in other words, about the issues, just open and closed, and the wa la adhab, there will be no punishment. <coughs> so people at that, that night were reflecting, who are those people? So some people said, They're the people who were born Muslim, into Muslim families. And they never had the chance to make shirk. So look at that, the companions are thinking, we were born in Jahiliyyah. And they're still a little bit fearful, even though the hadith said Islam wipes away your previous sins. They're fearful. What if that's, that's not as perfect as someone who never um, did shirk before? Even though it's forgiven. One thing is to be forgiven, and the other thing is to have never done that. Like, we know that people like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Uthman al-Affan, even in Jahiliyyah, they did not uh, drink, alcohol, drink wine. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, even in Jahiliyyah, never went near an idol. Um, so, the first people, they're the ones who will be told to enter Bab al Ayman min Jannah, the right hand side of Jannah. Um, they're the ones who have no hisab. So these are the ones who are referred to. So they, they spent the night, the companions, reflecting who might they be. They're the ones who were born in Islam and never did shirk. And there was another reason as well, La um, And then Rasulullah came out and said, and, and they, they said they'd been discussing, SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah, discussing who are the people who go to Jannah without hisab, without adab. He said, They're the ones who don't request ruqya from other people. Yeah. Three things. 
The first thing, they're the ones who do not request ruqya. It's similar to what they were thinking in a way. They were thinking it's to do with tawheed. Must be to do with tawheed. Laystaquna means in jahiliya, when people had any problem, they'd go to the, uh, the kahin, the fortune teller, the kahin, the sahir, and say, I've got this problem, please read something on me, blow on me. Where's their tawakkul? Where's their dua? So for any reason, they'd have this, they'd go to somebody who they feel is spiritually more advanced and ask for some sort of dua, etc. So while they were making shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their, with their idols, they were also making, uh, not shirk, but relying too much on individuals. And sometimes it was shirk because those individuals were magicians and fortune tellers. And they would ask them for signs about their future, about what will happen to them. So one of the benefits of not asking for ruqya, in the, according to this narration, is one, is to cut the connection, people's connection with the, 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 the people of Jahiliya who used to give do ruqya on people with shirk. And secondly, they used to give uh, tama'im, ta'weed, with shirk and sihr in it too. But ulama of Islam do take this narration further and they say that that unless there's an absolute necessity, do ruqya on yourself. There is a narration that says la yarquna, they do not, they do, not do ruqya, meaning they don't even do ruqya on themselves. Ibn Taymiyyah says that this contradicts all the other narration which says yes tarquna, which is to request ruqya. So the, the authentic understanding, this is one of the, the, perhaps the strongest understanding of this narration is they are the ones who do not request ruqya. Why? Because it's po- it's part of tawakkul to do your dua for yourself as much as possible. Do your own dua. Uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, when he was asked, Ud'u lana ya shaykh, uh, make dua for us, he would say, Ana ahwaj ila dua. I need the dua more. Trying to educate the person to not rely on the ulama and the mashaykh for, the, for dua, but develop your own dua. Develop your own connection with Allah. This is your tawheed. As the hadith in Tirmidhi says, اختلفوا إسناده وقال بعضه إنه حسن مَنْ لَمْ يَدُعُ الله يغضب عليه. Whoever is not doing dua to Allah, he is angry with him. As Allah Ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكِبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي Those who are too arrogant to worship me. And that's said in the context of dua. سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ Will enter Jahannam in humiliation. So the three who are saved without hisab ولا عذاب are who? One, هُمُ الَّذِينَ لَا يَسْتَرْقُونَ They do not request ruqiyah. If there's a necessity, of course, there's another issue. There's a necessity. If you've got a headache, you don't say to the next person, could you blow on my, read Allah on my, or Qul Adun Falakum and blow on me, please. No. Do your own ruqya. Unless there's a necessity of a severe case of sihr, etc. And you can do ruqya on other people if they don't mind. Humu alladhina la yastarquna wa la yatatayyaruna. And they do not do tatayyur. Tatayyur is to do with the birds that fly in the sky. Superstitions people might feel when they see, like you, you wake up in the morning, you open the window, and there's five crows in your back garden. <coughs> and the person thinks for a second, oh my goodness, this is a bad day for me. It is going to be a bad day. Five bad things are going to go wrong. So Ibn Mas'ud, <laughs> Ibn Mas'ud said, he said, he used to mention the hadith, Man tatayyira faqad ashrak. Whoever believes in the birds, has, disbel- has committed shirk. It's, it's to do with minor shirk, which is bad itself. We know it's minor shirk. Shirk is the issue. But don't, I don't want people to think they've left Islam. Whoever, but then he said, وَمَا مِنَّا إِلَّا But there's none of us except he might get this. Meaning, there might be a moment of superstition that comes into someone's heart unconsciously. فَيُذْهِبُهُ اللَّهُ بِالتَّوَكُّلُ But Allah removes it with dependence. So the ulama, they advise if you say, if you have a situation of a momentary tatayyur, good luck, bad luck, etc., a person thinking that they're with their lucky pen, astaghfirullah, lucky pen, for a moment, um, that they're going to do well in their exam. La ilaha illallah, tawakkal ala Allah. Remove it with la ilaha illallah. Remove it with tawakkul. Dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Um, so can you see these, the, the third thing, wala yaktawuna. And they're the ones who don't do iktiwa. Iktiwa is... Uh, in English, cauterization. It's a type of to brandish with a hot iron uh, your, a person's body who's got a wound. For example, he's been injured in, in battle and the wound's not healing. So they used to put the hot iron into a, into a furnace, bring it out, and then brandish the person. Of course, of course it would be an extreme pain. Uh, and that used, they used to, it used to help join, the, join that together. So it's, it's disliked. In Islam. Imam Nawawi spoke about Imran ibn Hussein. Imran ibn Hussein, sorry. No, Imran ibn Hussein, no, Sad. 
that he radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he spoke about him had he used to, his back passage used to was bleeding his back passage his anal passage alhamdulillah uh, was bleeding he had a type of piles hemorrhoids which was very severe and it would bleed to the extent that they'd have to put he was bedridden for 30 years they had to they'd have to put a hole in his bed so to collect the blood which was dripping down and into a container which was then removed and then put back um, so he mentioned the ulama mentioned a story of a visitor who came in who wept when he saw his, his state and condition and he said yeah imran ibn hussein uh, imran hussein said why are you weeping he said because of your condition the visitor said he said um, if allah loves this for me then i love it Verily, I love illnesses. So in the con, you shouldn't ask for an illness. But once it happened, his condition in his mind was, if Allah loves this situation for me, and it's not going away, in other words. If Allah wants this for me, I love whatever Allah wants. He knows it's good for me, in other words. But in one narration, Imam Nawi mentions that, that he, Allahu A'lam, how the ulama affirmed this. Uh, Imam Nawi mentioned that they, he used to hear the salam of the malaika. He used to hear the salam, salamu alaykum of the malaika until he brandished himself, until he used the brandishing, the cauterization. And then when he, uh, when he felt remorse for that, he, uh, the salams returned to him. Allah ta'ala alam. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the, within the company of the awliya. Yeah, ikhwa, there's, there's just a little bit more, inshallah, for the, the introduction to this topic. Today, inshallah, this is just an introduction to the topic, meaning you, you're going to read more, you can study more, but I'm, I want to just, just highlight to you a couple of points, inshallah. The hadith continues. The hadith continues. And a lot of ulama say the continuation of the hadith is two hadith put together by one of the narrators because it, the hadith continues and speaks about people who have already gone to the fire. So it implies judgment has begun. Judgment had began, people were taken to the fire, and then certain, they were taken out of the fire. Um, people kept on being taken out of, their fire, out of the fire um, into Jannah. And then the people who had a tiny amount of iman were also taken out of Jannah, out, out of the uh, Jahannam. The, finally, inshallah. The types of shafa'a, first of all, is the shafa'a which we spoke about, shafa'a al-uzma, for the commencement of the Day of Judgment. This is for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-thani al-shafa'a fi ahli al-dhunub min al-muwahideen al-ladhin indakhalu al-nar. The shafa'a for the people who are of tawheed, who've got sins, the noob, they've entered the fire. Um, this is to, and with this category of shafa'a, there is a narration in Muslim where Allah Ta'ala, where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, that Allah Ta'ala says يَشْفَعُ النَّبِيُّونَ يَشْفَعُ النَّبِيُّونَ وَيَشْفَعُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالنَّبِيُّونَ وَالصَّالِحُونَ The وَلَمْ يَبْقَى إِلَّا رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَكَمَا قَالَ صلى الله عليه وسلم في الحديث The angels have interceded. So it affirms that angels can intercede for people. There could be an angel who saw your righteous action that would say, oh Allah, on such and such day, I saw this person avert himself from such and such sin. Oh Allah, intercede for him to be taken out of the fire. Um, the hadith which we... Uh, sorry, the second thing of Shafa'a, uh, the Nabi, Nabiyun, the other prophets too will intercede. <coughs> and and the salihun, righteous people, siddiqun, shuhada, the people of shahada and shuhada, all can intercede. The hadith said that shaheed yashfa'u li sabi'ina min ahli, min ahlihi. The shaheed intercedes for 70 people from his family. Subhanallah al Then there is the shafa'a. One of the shafa'as is um, for Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, and we notice in that hadith, one of the shafa'as was for people to start to enter Jannah to begin the entrance into Jannah with his shafa'a. Another shafa'a is shafa'a of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa for people whose good and bad deeds are equal. So he will intercede and they will enter Jannah. Uh, and there are those who are with his shafa'a, they will be in Jannah, they deserve Jannah, but because of his shafa'a and intercession and asking Allah, they will go to a higher position in Jannah. 
Uh, and we mentioned the people who went to Jannah without hisab. And there, are, there is one shafa'ah which is khas for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is another shafa'ah which is khas for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The shafa'ah is um, that with regards to his uncle, he said that his uncle is in a dahdah of na min na yughatti qadamayhi yaghli lahuma dimagha. That he will be in a puddle of fire. He said, because of my shafa'a, he will be in a puddle of fire which will cover his feet, which will make his brain boil. And the narration said, if it wasn't for my shafa'a, he would be in the, in the lowest part of the hellfire. Okay, there's two aspects to uh, his uncle Abu Talib. One was that he uh, supported Rasulullah and assisted him and suffered, uh, suffered while he was defending Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was hurt and suffered economically uh, and in his hunger, etc. But the other side was that he knew the truth, uh, which, which reminds us of uh, reminds us of a munafiq. But really, Allah says about the kuffar of Mecca as a whole, وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يَجْحَدُونَ They used to have juhud of my ayat. Juhud is when you reject something, but you know internally it's right. You reject something, but you know it's right. So the mushrikeen of Mecca were described as people who knew the truth, but they rejected it outwardly. And people today are of different categories. Some are doing juhud, some just don't know. Abu Talib, because of the, the positive element, he, he has interceded. And because of that, he will be in the, lowest, in a low, the, the, the least person punished in a puddle of Jahannam, by which his brain boils. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Guide us to be of the people who the Quran intercedes for us, your Siyam intercedes for us. May Allah make us people who um, do not curse people much and insult people and use swear words because that are, these are of the things that stop people getting shafa'a. Um, in the narration, Rasulullah was asked by Abu Huraira, who are the people who have got the most right to be to have your shafa'a? And then Rasulullah said, because you love hadith, I was, I was wondering when you would ask me, or I, I, was, I knew you would ask me, or I was wondering when you would ask me. Um, the people who have the greatest right for my shafa'a are those who say La ilaha illallah sincerely from their hearts. So sincerely from your hearts is carried in every situation night and day. And that is a hadith that teaches us the importance of La ilaha illallah. Can we not see why after Fajr and after uh, Asr or Maghrib you can, you, we say La ilaha illallah ten times? Or a hundred times, La ilaha illallah, there is no one worthy of worship but Allah. Wahdahu la sharika lah, he is alone. La sharika lah, he has no partners in worship. Lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamd, to him is the kingdom of the universe. Wa lahu al-hamd, and to him, he, and to him is all praise and thanks. Wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, and he has power over everything. We say this ten times and we get the reward of freeing four slaves. That's a, that's a lot of reward. It's like, imagine one slave could be 30,000 pounds, 50,000 pounds, four of those. Or if, if you say up to, you can say it up to a hundred times. And the hadith says that you will not be touched by shaitan. One of the ulama of Ruqya said, I did Ruqya on an individual. And then when I, when I, when I spoke to the individual, he said, the, the shaitan, the jinn that was in the person, replied, I will leave this person who I've afflicted, but I'm going to jump into you. So the person said, try. <coughs> a, few, a second or two later, the, the person who was afflicted started to cry. And it was actually the, 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 the shaitan, the jinn. The jinn said, he said, why are you crying? He said, I couldn't get inside you. He said, yes, because I said, la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu lahu al-mulku la hamdu wa la kulli shayin qadil a hundred times. So that's why one of the, our scholars in Egypt who used to be very proficient in, he used to do a lot of ruqya, but he stopped, um, they say. Tayyib ikhwa, um, and also, I have to mention this hadith. We, we mentioned the hadith of dua. Of the Allahumma Rabba hadhi da'wati tama wa salati qa'ima, the hadith of the adhan. Who is the subject matter in the hadith of the adhan? Who, who is it? It's about Rasulullah. Give him the wasila. So the importance and significance given to Muhammad Rasulullah is of the matters that get us the shafa'a. To want him to have wasili and the maqam of Mahmud. To love him means to love his way. Like he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you do not truly believe until I am dearer to you than your fathers, your sons, and the whole of uh, mankind. But there's one hadith I want to mention, which will be the last hadith. Ma'alish, ya ikhwa. Qadr Allah ma'a shafa'al, the unseat, 
So we, we, we're reflecting on the importance of the, our tawheed and ikhlas and to and ittiba' al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to deserve this shafa'a. Because there are those who make an error in shafa'a. In shafa'a, there are principles. The one who, who uh, permits the shafa'a and the one who does the shafa'a. So there are some people who say the shafa'a will occur from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those who made shirk. They allow people who went to uh, graves of righteous people but, and they believed in those righteous people that they knew the unseen. They knew, they, and they, they made these errors. They, they don't realize that. It's the one who says, La ilaha illa mukhlisan min qalbi. The, the purpose of saying, Allah rabba hadi da'wati tamma, the, the hadith of the adhan, is to understand the position of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to be followed in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so, La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah are the principles of getting the shafa'a. Wa jazakumullah khairan. Uh, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiru wa tawbu ilayk wa allahu ta'ala a'lam uh, ya allahu ta'ala